Well, hello and welcome to this week's show. Oh, we have some viewers. That's wonderful. Post your thoughts, as always, you know the routine. Post your thoughts and your comments during the live show. I always say this, post them during the live show. But of course, wherever you're watching or listening to the show, whenever, whatever, wherever, uh, you can still post comments because I do read them afterwards and I share them with our guests and email them to them or they come back and view them. But anyway, post your thoughts and comments during the live show, the one that's going out now as it happens uh, below the live stream and my guest will of course respond to them in the next hour. And please click the subscribe button and thank all of you, I thank everyone for doing this wherever you're watching or listening so you can be notified of a fresh edition every single week. Now, onto the show. Colin Mockery was born in Kilmarnock, Scotland. And when he was seven, his parents moved to Montreal, Quebec. And when he was 12, they moved to Vancouver, British Columbia. But each time they moved, he found them. Colin is an alumnus of Toronto's Second City, where so many comic and comedy legends honed and refined their their craft. Uh, people such as Martin Short, John Candy, uh, Gilda Radner, Mike Myers, Dan Aykroyd, and the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Colin's face, and it, it's a lovely face, uh, uh, along with the rest of his body, was a weekly fixture on Whose Line Is It Anyway? on both the British and American versions, proving that he is indeed bilingual. If I was to list the number of TV shows, films, and stage productions in which Colin has performed, we wouldn't have time for today's show. It's endless, just like my introductions, and it, it truly is. It, it goes to many, many pages. Colin is one of the world's most respected and loved improvisational comedy actors, and during the pandemic, he has teamed up with fellow Who's Line alum, Brad Sherwood, and together they entertain audiences with their improv skills, but more on that later on. Colin is currently starring in the much-needed comedy, and it's a film which you can watch everywhere at the moment, streaming everywhere. It's called Boys vs. Girls, and, and I, I urge you now, and I'll urge you at the end of the show to watch it, because what we need on this planet right now is, is a chuckle and something light-hearted to lift us out of the... Uh, the, the rotten hole that we're in. Colin Mark is in our, our virtual green room, and before I bring him onto the show, let's go ahead and watch the trailer for Boys vs. Girls, and, uh, and then we'll bring him on. This will be about, I don't know, 60 seconds, or maybe a minute. Roll we'll tape. Welcome, campers, to the opening campfire of 1990 here at Camp Kindlewood. <laughs> Now, uh, as uh, most of you already know by now, the camp is now co-ed, which is a great thing. There will be both boys and girls in the camp altogether. You've got to make this work, right? Go team! But seriously, we hate having these chicks here. Roger sees how toxic you guys are. No, 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 no. It's on. Well, you may have started it, but we're going to finish this. <laughs> you shouldn't be allowed to work near children. Or people. I'm not. That's why I'm at the camp. I am pleased to welcome Colin Mockery to this program. Hello, Colin. Hello, Phil. How are you? I am fantastic. You look fantastic. Let me get well, your name up there. You feel I mean, fantastic? Yeah. Yeah, I feel good. You do? Well, you know, more or less. Good, good. Let, I'll ask you that question at the end of the conversation we have. Oh, all right. We'll see how it goes. So, look, I want to start out by asking you the question you probably asked Oh, well, every single show 
host you encounter probably asks you this, but I, I have to ask you. I, mean, I no, normally don't ask predictable questions, but why on earth do people call you baldy flat scalp? It's really hard. Who knows? Jealousy, I guess. Could it be Maybe jealousy? A fear, a little fear of what their future holds, and they may not be able to embrace it as fully as someone who obviously is just in charge of their masculinity. And you are in charge of your masculinity. I've, I've heard that through the grapevine. Absolutely. Now, when I look at videos from you um, from 25 years ago, it, it's simply amazing uh, how using Rogaine changed your entire appearance. Mm -hmm. You look like a different man since the, from 25 years ago. Yeah. Well, it, it happens. I... I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say anyone who you see at one point and then see them at 25 years later, there's going to be a bit of a difference. Actually, to, uh, to be honest, and I don't kiss up to my guests, I, th I think you actually look bloody good uh, 25 years later than you did Thanks. when you had brown hair. You know, it, you, yeah. you've come into your hair. I, I, luckily, I aged fast and then slowed down. You know, so, that, that does happen. Seriously, people get to a certain age and then they seem to, seem to stay at that age. And I, I did make a note to myself. I wanted to ask you this. This is a serious question. Uh, I'm looking for a car for my wife. Do you still own the grey 1964 Volkswagen Beetle? Can we buy that off you? No. No, I do not. You got it's, rid of it. Ah. I got rid of it when I moved to Toronto from uh, Vancouver. Uh, I missed that car. I, you can I, actually see the road through um, <laughs> the bottom of the car. I got it. <laughs> I think it was twenty dollars, and uh, it, it did well for a couple of years. It was like a Fred Flintstone car. It was getting there. It was getting <laughs> very close. I, I just want to uh, wish you uh, a belated congratulations, both to you and to your wife Deborah, on your thirty-second wedding anniversary, which I believe was today, two weeks ago. Uh, I it was, yes. Yeah. So I hope you remembered it. No, oh, absolutely. No, it's a, it's a highlight of our lives. We really enjoy each other, which, you know, has helped in the 32 years. Well, I want to put a photo up so people can see you with your wife. Your, your wife is a stunning lady, and she, uh, and, um, she looks like, in the photo I've got of the two of you, you've got your chin in, in, in the palm of her hand, and it looks like she's got you by the palm of her hand. So, um, anyway... Uh, We'll we'll talk about how the two of you met a little later. So let's get into some some in interesting areas of your life that interest me, fascinate me, and, mm -hmm. and and gives me an idea of how you got on this incredible journey that we've we've all enjoyed uh, from your career. You attended uh, Killarney Secondary School in Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, where you kept yourself pretty much yourself. And I'm wondering if that was because you moved so much and hadn't made friends. Uh, and also, perhaps, because you, at that point, maybe you still had a Scottish accent, which I know can be an issue for kids. I had the Scottish accent beaten out of me fairly soon, uh, arriving in um, Montreal. So I would say within a couple of months, it was gone because I was, yeah, I was seven. So I adapted fairly quickly. And uh, yeah, then the moving, the moving thing, I, I think it can go um, two ways you can be uh, really funny because you know you're moving from town to town you you have that skill to make friends fast I went the other way and sort of became invisible I had I, I did have friends I wasn't um, you know so sad but I, I was a very quiet uh, very funny um, uh, with my friends but not beyond that when you say you had the accent beaten out of you, I hope you don't mean that literally. Oh, sure. Canadian toughs are the worst toughs. Um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, the constant. And it was odd because um, there's a, a, a strong British population in Canada, at, yeah. at, certainly at that point. Yeah. But, yeah, they, they had something against the Scottish accent. So I quickly found a way to get rid of that. I didn't get beaten all the time. I mean, no. I got fairly good at talking myself out of getting beaten. Uh, which leads me on to the next question. And uh, because this, this I've, I found inc 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 just incredible. You, you were persuaded 
by a fern to audition for a play called The Death and Life of Sneaky Fitch mm -hmm. uh, while, while you were at school. And you were cast in the role of The Undertaker. Mm -hmm. um, but you wanted to be a marine biologist. So what on earth made your friend or you think that you'd be any good on the stage? And I'm wondering whether when I speak to a lot of people who did have tough times at school, they got out of tricky situations by uh, engaging in humor. So I'm just wondering if, if you did anything when you when people did have a problem with your accent or with you being a stranger to, or an outsider, whether at any time you did anything which convinced your friend and you that you might have a, a possibility on the stage? Um, good question. I don't, when I got into high school, I was very, uh, again, quiet. I, I had my close friends and I was amusing with them. Yeah. I was an honor student. I had decided I was going to become a marine biologist. And I think it was only based because I loved the show Flipper. <laughs> so I wanted to do something with dolphins. And my friend, I think part of it was, and I, I have to say, Roland Rossman, uh, I am grateful to you forever. Um, it, there may be more cruelty in it <laughs> than not. I, he, <laughs> he just dared me to read for the school play. And um, I said yes, and I vaguely remember just trying to get the gumption to do it. I did it, and when I got the part, I thought, oh, okay. And then I, I quickly got into the sort of the community part of being in theater. And um, there were girls, um, so I, I came out of my shell a little bit. But it wasn't until opening night and I got my first laugh that um, I, I just so remember that moment. And I knew at that moment that was all I wanted for the rest of my life. I wanted that feeling again that I got from making that entire auditorium laugh at the same time. And from then uh, on, I became almost a different person. I... Um, talked to um, uh, the principal and uh, vice principal and talked them into letting me do the morning announcements. So I had sort of a little mm -hmm. sketch group. I would write, uh, I get the announcements the previous night. Then that night I would write a little skit. We do right. it in the morning. And then I sort of became known for that. And then I got more involved in theater. Sciences kind of went out the window. Being an honor student went out the window. Uh, I became a little more social. And then it just kind of built from there. So, so it, you you can basically, I mean, a lot of people hide behind their uh, uh, alter ego. I, I was actually I, what I what I'd like to know is, do you remember? Because you must have had this, and this is what turned you onto it. When you when you heard the audience laugh at a line that you spoke, uh, and it was the first time you'd heard the audience laugh with you or at you, but not at you at, at what you said. Uh, do you remember the adrenaline rush or, or the oh. feeling that you had? Yeah, I, it's what I would imagine like a, a hit of heroin being. It was just my entire body like literally tingled. And it was like, ah, oh. <laughs> it, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was amazing. Um, I, I always get chills when I talk about it because I still feel that, uh, which is great. And yeah. um yeah. So uh, thank you, Roland. Yeah. Well, that that is, you know, uh, there there are sort of destinies, I think, in life. And I mean, you know, just opening the little door and going through it. There you had a little door and you went through it and it, it changed your life and uh, changed who you were. Now, after graduating high school, you became a student at the, 50, the uh, Studio 58 Theatre School in Vancouver, which is from what I can see from I've checked it out now, it's an incredibly intense course. And after Studio 58, you became a member of Vancouver Theatre Sports, uh, the, the theatre organization, which is just primarily focused on improv. You were really dedicated to your career. Had you decided by this time that improv was, to use the word I just used, your destiny? Uh, no. 
I just thought it was something fun to do. Um, because when I started improv, it was 1980, and it was still really un unknown. Um, aside from Jonathan Winters on television, and uh, I guess Robin Williams had just maybe uh, sort of hit the consciousness at that point. Nobody knew what improv was. And when we were starting, um, our th the theater that um, the guy who owned it, Ray Michael, God bless him also, um, said, you know what, you guys can, after our main show, you guys can have the theater from 11 o'clock uh, on Fridays and Saturdays. And so we would go to the McDonald's next door and say, hey, come see our show. Uh, we have a new show. And they say, oh, what is it? We said, well, we don't know. Uh, you have to shout things at us. And then we make up stuff. And uh, from that to within a year, there were lineups uh, around the blocks because it was this thing that had never been seen before. It was like these. And what I loved at that time when we were starting, it wasn't just actors that we had a guy who uh, was a cable installer. We had some teachers. Uh, we had people from all walks of, of life doing um, improv. And I think that really helped me um, sort of hone my craft and work with these amazing people who all had different points of view. Yeah. You know, um, before... Uh, I just want to let everyone know before we uh, started today's show, I was I was uh, talking to Colin about um, a, a show that I've been thoroughly enjoying on Amazon Prime, which is the amazing Mrs. Uh, Meisel and uh, the fact that Lenny Bruce uh, was a tragic, a tragic comedy figure uh, only because of what happened to him was in it. And, and I'm just thinking while we're speaking, do you think there was an element of, there must there was an element of improv in what Lenny Bruce did, wasn't there? Even though it wasn't called improv. Yeah, I think so. A lot of, I mean, a lot of, of the great comedians I remember watching would have an element and were able to play with the audience if a joke didn't go well or um, if someone was heckling them. So they had sort of a... Uh, sort of that slight improv talent where they could take something and, and go off on it. And I think probably, you know, coming up with the material, there was some improv going, okay, let's start with this idea and working out different ways to sort of get their um, ideas across. As, as uh, a stream of consciousness, which is something that, that you do in improv. And uh, it, that was un maybe the, 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 the seed of it back then. Yeah. Um, so I want to move on. During this, this is a bit like uh, this is a bit like this is your life. I know, but there's there's elements of your life that, as I say, I uh, I have guests on this show whose whose work I absolutely adore, and it always um, uh, it appeals to me to you know to to learn how they got to where they got because nothing is accidental. It's all yeah. There's some there there are some happy accidents. We've already discussed how you. You went on the stage, but it was during this period in your life uh, that you met Ryan Stiles, who you went on to work with on Who's Line and, and also the Drew Carey show, where you made several appearances. You then connected with Ryan again at Second City when you joined their touring company. And this was a monumental period for you. You fell in love with Deborah McGrath, who we've just said you've been married to now for 32 years. She was the director of the company and you got married in uh, 1989. It seems like your life came together during this period. It seems like this destiny I'm talking about really, really sort of gelled at this particular time. Would you agree with that? Do you think this was, is, is this a period that you think of fondly and think of that's when it all started? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I hate, and because I hate to give him credit, um, I think Ryan uh, Stiles was a big, uh, like a major um, player in my life. Uh, when we met, um, it was at theater sports. He, at that point, was a stand-up. And um, not a great stand-up. Uh, a lot of his jokes were about Dolly Parton <laughs> and low-budget zoos. So low-budget, they just had a picture of a giraffe. That was <laughs> one of his jokes that I, I just remember. And But a lot of his acts... <laughs> was he would just start talking to the audience and that's where his strength was. He would uh. be really funny talking to them. So we started working together and it was one of those, um, 
you know, love at first sight kind of things where immediately we gelled. We have a lot of the same reference level. We find the same things funny. And what I love about Ryan is um, it's difficult for a lot of stand-ups to work with others. I mean, we've been fortunate, like, who's like Greg Proops, an amazing um, comedian and a great improviser. But what I loved about uh, Ryan was he would get as much pleasure uh, setting you up for the joke and you finishing it as he would getting the laugh. And that was something I learned from him because it, it really is an ensemble art. So everybody's share, actually sharing in the laugh. So he and that's talked, very generous. That is incredibly oh, absolutely. generous. Absolutely. And it was when we were uh, doing theater sports, Second City was doing a show at Expo, which was being held in Vancouver that year. And Ryan and I auditioned together with another guy. Ryan and the other guy got hired. And I found out later it's because they needed a tall guy and a fat guy. <laughs> it was kind of in between. <laughs> Um, so Ryan did the run at, of Second City and because of course he's uh, great, they asked him to go back to Toronto and uh, do Second City there. And it, it was right after Expo, I decided I'd like to do something uh, different. And Ryan said, you come, come out to Toronto. So I did. Uh, he called me up and said, listen, there's an opening in the touring company. Um, I talked to him about you. Uh, why don't you audition? So I did. And the woman that was uh, the director and holding the audition was Deb, who, uh, so it was a very tough audition. <laughs> and at the end of the audition, she said, well, it was between you and the cute guy, and you got it. And I went, oh, I'm huh. intrigued. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. So Ryan, uh, Ryan got me, um, in a way, he got me a job and a wife. That was very, very kind of him. I, I have to say also that, I don't have to say, I want to say that um, I think that you and Ryan Stiles, and, I, and don't take this, in. this isn't meant in a funny way, this is meant in a flattering way. And there's only a few people that I can think of. I was thinking about this actually. Um, I, I was thinking about you this morning in my shower, which isn't, <laughs> which, right. which <laughs> take <I agree>. that. <laughs> Um, but I was thinking there's there's a few people back in the day, it would have been Woody Allen, uh, definitely Peter Sellers, Stanley Lowell, um, there's there's others that I thought of. Oh, um, um uh I can't think of the Englishman's name with the poppy out eyes. Uh, uh oh, Marty Feldman. Marty Feldman. And you and Ryan Styles. You have these faces that you just look at your faces and you start laughing. And and Rowan Atkinson, uh, you have these sort of malleable faces, but but somehow you and Ryan, when you look at your faces, you both seem to have these impish faces and you know that you're not going to be up to any good and you know that we're going to just get a belly full of laughs because we can see from your faces that you're not going to stay like that. And um, are you aware of that? Um, well, I, I have been told it a lot, so I guess I am aware. Oh, OK. I, I never, well, you know, OK. When you look in the mirror, you go, I, I mean, I personally don't start laughing. <laughs> I think, all right, <laughs> holding it together. Uh, I mean, Ryan, I can see Ryan um, in Mad Magazine. There was an artist called Don Martin and all his cartoons look like Ryan. So I think there's that sort of, um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think we do have a, um, I, I think there is a, a something, whether it's our faces or whatever, but I think people immediately get ready to, to laugh. Yeah, absolutely. I promise you we will get, get onto your new film in a minute, but there's a few things that, uh, that are just just amazing how these uh, you, you, you connect all the dots or, you, or the, the way I see it is you have a jigsaw puzzle and you, you just you, f you finally found, find the bit that's missing. And I, um, David Shepard and uh, Paul Sills founded Second City and, uh, and students are taught techniques developed by Sill's mother. She was an actress and acting coach, Viola Spolin. 
Spolin's Theatre Games, it was called Theatre Games, transform the teaching of acting skills and techniques into exercises that are in the form of games. Isn't that amazing that you learnt that and ultimately it became very much an integral part of what you are known for? I mean, it, that must that alone must have helped you when you ultimately uh, did get into shows like uh, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I was fortunate enough I, um, at Second City, when I was at Second City, they would always bring people in for workshops. And David Shepard was one of the people who uh, gave oh. us a workshop. And uh, it's just invaluable. Um and not only, I always tell this, improv is a, you know, a great skill to have as a person. And Deb and I actually, maybe 10 years ago, uh, kind of decided, why don't we use those skills and those rules in our life? Like The main uh, thing is yes-anding, where somebody says something and you accept it and you build on it. And we thought, why don't we do maybe say yes to things that were a little outside of our comfort zone for whatever reason and see where it takes us. And the very first, after we'd made this choice, the very first thing we were asked to go to the Congo with a group called World Vision and do um, some commercials to sort of focus on um, getting foster um, parents for, for kids there. And the Congo was never on my list as a holiday destination. And we went uh, right after Christmas. Um, so we were going from North American consumerism out of control to the jungles uh, of Africa where uh, people are poor. Mm -hmm. It was the most amazing two weeks I've ever spent anywhere. These people who had nothing. I just remember Deb um, leading them in the hokey pokey, all the kids doing the hokey pokey by, by the lake. They just had this light, even though they had nothing. In some ways, they seemed like they had everything, but weren't telling me what exactly. Uh, but it was it was fascinating. So I'm so glad that at that moment we had decided, let's say yes to things and let whatever happens happen. Well, that little boy in school probably would have said no and walked away. So uh, you, you certainly changed your, your perspective. Um, now, here's a lesson. I want to share this with the audience watching or just listening. Uh, here's a lesson for anybody who has a passion for their career. And it doesn't have to be comedy, any form of entertainment. But I want you to listen to this because this is totally mind-blowing. I think you have to be short of a marble to do this, but none, nonetheless, uh, it, it is the uh, true definition for me of passion for your art, passion for your craft. In 1989, you auditioned for the new British Channel 4 improv show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? But you, the only word you heard after your audition was, Next! You... You and Deborah moved to Los Angeles, and while there, you auditioned a second time for the show. This is the UK show. And this time, you're invited to London. Whoa. And you did one show, and they said, next. <laughs> and they sent you packing. Why on earth, and this is why I want people to, to take note of this, why on earth, my dear Colin, did you audition a third time, even though it turned out to be the charm? Um, throughout my career and <laughs> my life, in fact, I have found that most of the difficult times have actually been caused by me. Um, the first audition I had for Whose Line was at Second City, and I can't put my the blame on me for this one because um, we were we did that we had a show. Um, the producers Don or uh, uh, Dan Patterson and Mark Levison saw the show, loved it, loved us had auditions for us the next morning at eight. Not the best time for uh, comedy auditions, especially with a cast who's working like till two in the morning. But we did, I thought we did uh, good auditions, but the problem was 
because we were a cast and we had been working together for a while, we did what you're supposed to do. Everybody was supporting each other. So nobody stood out. Everybody was working on, let's make the scene good. So none of us got it. And then the next time in LA, it was with people I didn't know. It was like, hey, screw you, look at me. I, I learned from that last time. And that's when I got it. Then when I got to London, I totally psyched myself out. I thought, okay, we have, we have the same language, but the references are going to be different. Will they understand my kind of humor? So I uh, pulled back. And oh. my first show was with uh, Sandy uh, Toxvig, Tony Slatter, uh, Slattery, and Mike McShane, who were all lovely. And we met an hour before the show. And that was, an, I thought, I don't know these people. I, and so I freaked myself out and quite frankly sucked. I think there was one, I did one thing that was funny. Um, and that may have been the thing that kept them in, uh, kept me in their mind. Mm. But it wasn't until, um, I guess, the next year, they were doing shows in New York for some weird reason. I, I don't know why. And at that point, mm. Ryan was with the cast. And oh. he said, give Colin another chance. And they had liked me and were disappointed that I had sucked. <laughs> so they brought um, they brought me to New York. And what happened in New York was it was sort of a reverse. All the British people were, oh, well, these Americans understand our humor. And the producers put me with Ryan, who I worked with for years, and we were very comfortable. And from then on, I became more and more entrenched. Although every year they would say, we're probably going to use you for one or two shows. They would never say, <laughs> oh, my goodness, we'll see how it goes. And then I would end up doing the entire run. But yeah. every year for until I think about the sixth year I was on the British, they said, we're, you're doing all the shows. How dare they? How dare they <laughs> do that to you? Um, I, I want uh, to show a clip and then we'll move on to your new film. I, I want to just end this part of the show with uh, showing a clip that I've put together from an early, very early UK version of Whose Line Is It Anyway? And this is uh, the, <laughs> the brilliant sketch, one, one of my favourites, uh, where you can only answer a question with a question, which is damn difficult. I've tried it in the shower a few times. It doesn't work for me. You do a lot in the shower. I time. do an awful lot in the shower, but we won't get into that now. But anyway, here first is the uh the host uh it's not sandy toxvig it's clive anderson and uh we are going to see something quite interesting let's roll the tape welcome, welcome to whose line is it anyway the improvisation show which makes neighbors look well prepared and teletubbies look like the jewel in the crown <laughs> featuring tonight the return of the distinguished royal shakespearean actress comedy store player and the man in the streets favorite improviser josie lawrence and the surprise return of actor novelist playwright intellectual and most famous visitor to belgium since adolf hitler stephen fry <laughs> then the not particularly surprised return of the most famous canadian to visit his country since leonard cohen's last tour colin mockery and finally the constant surprising combination of skills talents and spare parts that make up ryan styles and when the production we're going to start with a game. Would you like a chariot race? <laughs> Could you explain what a chariot race actually is? Does it always involve Stephen Boyd at the end getting dragged under the wheels of... <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Please try and... Um... <laughs> You're better when you stuck to Latin. <laughs> Do you order a pizza? Don't you have the food of the gods? What did you order? <laughs> Didn't I order some grapes? Can you handle pepperonis? <laughs> What's a pepperoni? I don't. <laughs> Stephen Fry is a real smarty pants, but he oh. seems like such a super nice bloke. Lovely. And um, he started that scene doing it in Latin. I, I, yes. Yeah. Really? Okay. <laughs> but yeah, incredibly brilliant man, incredibly talented and just lovely. What you would think if you said, oh, this person's quite lovely. Everything that that makes you think of, that's Stephen Fry. I, I have never seen him, uh, you know, e except when uh, I have seen him debate the church. 
on yes. television and and he he is a, a wonderful debater and he was i i've seen some wonderful youtube debates with him and 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 the late and one of my heroes i will admit it uh hitch uh christopher hitchens uh the two of them together were quite dynamic but he's his, anyway i i want to ask you a question now i'm very serious at this point i mean we've been serious all along but mm -hmm. serious at this point and it's a personal question but you have you have touched on it before and and i'm sure um you'll understand why i'm i'm asking you this question um and it's 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 actually something that um i have been studying a lot lately um with the help of youtube your your daughter kinley is a trans woman yes. and you and deborah were absolutely amazing supportive loving parents as any parent should be when she came out and told you but but i know and I've read stuff that, that Deborah's written, and I've seen uh, you and Kinley as well talking about this. I know how cruel and narrow-minded some people can be. Uh, since Deborah's also a comedy actor, can the three of you, but especially Kinley, given her parents' careers, use humor when faced with narrow-minded bigots? Um. It's, uh, yes, I think you can. It's hard because this is a personal thing. It's easier to make fun of bigots when it's not something that's, you know, attacking you um, specifically. Uh, but yes, when Kinley, uh, Kinley came out, um, it was, uh, I mean, our first thing was, of course, we were uh, accepting and she was great. She gave us a lot of material to look over. Um, but our first thing was, after accepting, was fear of her safety, of, and, you know, this is the best, at this point in history is the best time ever. It's still not great for uh, people coming out. So, um, and it's interesting, we were just talking, all three of us have an audition for the sitcom um, <laughs> uh, next week. So who knows, this could be a new dynasty. But um, could be, yeah. But yeah, we 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 do use a lot of humor. It's been interesting. Uh, it's been interesting for me in that when uh, Kinley came first came out, I put things out on Twitter with her blessing and and wrote some things, and I got a um, email from um, a trans man in London who has a theater dealing mostly with that community and said, I just want to say thank you for supporting your uh, uh, daughter. It's uh, because as you know, many parents do not. Can I just ask you to keep an eye on your homophobic stuff on whose line? And I immediately replayed every homophobic thing I've ever done there. I went, oh my God, yes. And I asked, do you mind if I put this on Facebook and, um, open up a discussion and we serve all the heads of different improv theaters and improvisers around the country and the world sort of weighed in on, and tried to make a, um, a vow to do better. And I, I think it has gotten better in this area. It is something now um, we think about. I mean, in the, when we did the homophobic things, and this is an excuse, it was uh, laziness and uh, just going for a laugh. Yeah. Forget that you've just denigrated an entire segment of the population. Yeah. Well, but the good thing is that uh, you've learned firsthand how um, upsetting that could be to some people. I mean, I think I think a lot of people take comedy, you know, uh, as as not so much pointing out uh, the differences between people, but just having fun. I mean, you can be self-deprecating in comedy and you can you can have a bit of fun at other people's expense, but not, you know, not as we have seen uh, in recent years, you know, in nasty, terrible, uh, blatantly uh, homophobic ways. I mean, especially the, the what we've gone through in America here and, and other countries. Uh, I mean, but anyway, I think you're forgiven 
I think you're forgiven your sins for that. There's so many um, things about the stupidity of humanity that can be made fun of. You know, we don't have to get into insulting groups of people. Yeah. Well, let's move on to the film. Let's move on to the film. Um, In the newly released, uh, it's multi-award winning, uh, brilliant Canadian comedy film, Boys vs. Girls, you lead a talented ensemble cast of young actors. Mike Stasko has written and directed and and produced this much-needed light relief, as I said at the beginning of the show, during these tough times we are all experiencing globally. Uh, The other brilliant, and I hate to use this word, but I have to, and you'll understand why I'm saying it, the other brilliant veteran comedy lead is Kevin MacDonald. And what you both, for me, I mean, I watched the film yesterday. I always, as you know, spend the day before uh, doing my research and also starting the day early watching my guest's film or read whatever they're, 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 they're coming the on the show for. Uh-huh. Yeah. You do it in the shower? You just watch from... I watched the film in the shower and um, and then I started singing along when you started, uh, you, 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 were, you were doing um, uh, that... that uh, well, we, we'll get into that in a minute. I have to talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, the the uh, so anyway, what I think uh, you and Kevin McDonald uh, brought to your respective roles, and it's so noticeable here uh, in a good way, is timing, impeccable comedic timing. It, 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 for that, and I know, I know that, you know, improv, you have to do this more than anything else. But in this film, I felt that um, you have to listen for the timing that you both had in this film. I mean, it was just that moment and then a look at your faces and then you, you said your lines. You, you, as the actor, have to listen to the other actors in your scenes to really make this timing work, rather than just saying your lines on cue. And that's something that a very fine comedy actor can do that not necessarily all actors can do. Do you, do you know what I'm, I mean, am I, am I saying something that's making sense here? That, that's why your two roles, where you and Kevin really stand out in this film uh, from, from the comedy element. Yeah. Uh- First, just let me say, um, I love Kevin McDonald. He is, again, one of the sweetest people you'll ever hope to meet and really funny. And he's really funny in this movie. And um, yes, I think it, uh, you know, we've both been in the business for a long time doing improv, sketch and different kinds of comedy. You you do learn. And we, we also were lucky we had it, it was a good cast, a, a good young as you seem you really seem to push the word young uh cast they certainly were listen when you get to our age and we're i'm I'm older than you young man but uh, not not much uh when you get to our age everyone is young i find myself calling a police officer yes young man officer and and (laughs) anyway uh continue i'm sorry yeah so um and of course uh in um uh, I mean, in movies, it's it's tougher in a way um, and in some ways easier because the editor could also edit it to make the timing better than it actually was shot out. Uh, but in this one, I think uh, because the, it, it was a, a good cast, we sort of got into um, a rhythm fairly quickly. And also, uh, Mike would let us improvise. So you basically have to listen because now that you're off script, you don't know when some cue may come up for you. So that made it uh, more fun and more, um, more flowing. Uh, the, well, I, I, I was like nodding my head just now, shaking my head. I don't think I would disagree with you on that point. I don't think that the editor would be able to pull off what a comedy actor can do if you keep the camera rolling and you just let them do their work, I think it, it, it would it would look too uh, convoluted for me. I just like um, we're going to show a scene in a minute. Yeah, which, I was just being humble. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you were. We're going to show a scene in a minute, which which proves my point. Um, let me just tell everyone what this film is about, because obviously right. after this show, 
or after they've watched the uh, video or listened to the audio, um, we want them to turn on, if they're in North America, if they're in, uh, uh, where else are they? Uh, Amer United States and Canada at the moment. We've, it's not global yet. But anyway, so let me tell them very briefly. It's the summer of 1990. Camp Kindlewood is forced to go co-ed. Usually one month is set aside for the girls and another for the boys. Uh, your character, my guest character, Roger, is I was going to say you are a, this is an English expression I think I was I was going to say you are a camp director but I think it's better to say you are the camp director there's a big difference between well, anyway you know what I'm talking about um that yeah you are the uh, the camp director trying to convince both groups that this is a great idea in an effort to keep the camp from being shut down by the corporate nasties there's always corporate nasties always, always. But after head counsellors, Dale, uh, played by Eric Osborne, good-looking young man, mm -hmm. young man, and Amber, played by, she is stunning, Rachel Dagenet, uh, they, they, they have an awkward encounter. And after that, all bets are off. And so begins the battle of the sexes, an attempt to win back what they feel is rightfully theirs. I think we have a scene here which I have called, I've labelled it going co-ed. So ladies and germs, let's watch this for about about a minute and then we'll be back to Colin Roll Tape. All of August, we got to be our true selves. Just girls, no boys. And that's just the way we liked it. The whole month of July, just testosterone, no girls. Roger, sit the fuck down. Listen, Dale, starting next summer, Camp Kindlewood is going to be co-ed. Wait, is that when? You can earn school credit? No. That's when two girls kiss each other, isn't it? No, it isn't. Thanks, I'm pretty sure it is. I got this VHS tape at home. No, Dale. The camp will be co-ed. There will be boys and girls at the same site for the entirety of summer. And that means there will probably have to be some changes made. Yeah, changes like what? No more naked morning dips. What? That's how we wake up in the morning and clean the cracks. Yeah, well, and also no more peeing wherever you happen to be. You mean we gotta walk to the washrooms? Yes. Even for number one. Specifically number one. It's the number two we can... No! Both numbers, all numbers. One, two, 43, all go into the washroom. <laughs> uh, I just love your expressions. And see, that's what I mean. You know, just... just uh... Anyway, there's a wonderful, definitely a wonderful chemistry going on between Eric and Rachel's characters. And I wrote, I actually wrote to, to Rachel, I... I I DM'd her on IG and told her how I felt that the camera absolutely loves her. Yes. Uh, uh, these two, uh, uh, these these two young actors, and I say young because they are. They've got yeah. big careers yeah. ahead of them, but uh, they're great together in their scenes. But but Rachel, uh, she's one of these 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 actresses, actors who actually, when they're on camera, they're just every aspect of their every expression, every uh, facial expression, every view of their face is just, you know, as a photographer, I've, I I noticed this immediately. It jumped out at me. She fills the screen and, and, and she's beautiful to look at and she's a good actress. But I'm wondering, um, <clears throat> here you are with people who are, you know, they're, they're on their, their journey uh, for a long time, we hope, uh, honing their arts. Did any of the younger cast come to you for for advice, recognizing your talents and knowing the work that you've accomplished? No, no, they, they don't, they don't care. Um, no, they didn't. Uh, I mean, it was all, um, I mean, I was there, I guess Kevin and I were there for maybe three days. So it was all fairly quick. Oh. Um, you know, we got, we got to talk. Uh, some of them were fans of Who's Line. Some of them didn't know. I think most of them, more of them were fans of Kids in the Hall. 
So they were more excited about Kevin. Yeah. Whatever. Um, but I think what both Kevin and I brought was, um, and, and not that they were unprofessional in any way, but we were very professional. We took it very seriously. We, we knew our lines. We showed up on time. We were very, um, you know, we, we shared, it wasn't even a trailer. I think it was, but we shared something where we could change. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't, um, it was a low budget movie. And the thing I love about low budget movies is everybody gives more than 150%. Everybody, because they, you know, you can't throw cash at something. And, you know, the props people usually taking things from home just to get that right look. And everyone's working under um, a, a lot of stress. But with a young production, there's still hope in their eyes. And that's what I love working. <laughs> I love seeing that hope yeah. and that that joy. And just as much, I hope we influence in some way um, what they do in the future or how they appear on set. But they also influence us. It's like they remind you of, oh, yeah, this is this is fun. You know, these days can be long. You're doing the same thing over and over again. But there's still a joy to that and a fun to that. You're working with your people. Um, these people who have decided to try to make a living in one of the hardest jobs success wise that there is one of the few jobs where you have to keep going for interviews your entire career yeah um, and it's the only job i think that you get um refused because it, it's because of you it's not because of your skill set it's like you don't look right for this part or yeah. you're not going to fit the costume or it, it's also personal. Yes. Yeah. But I, the, one of the reasons that I so enjoy and have been featuring uh, independent films is because they are low budget and because everyone in these films, including character actors, let's say, and you're a character actor in this film, um, do it for passion. They certainly don't do it for money. They do, they do it for passion. How are you at learning lines? Because, I mean, we've established, we've spent half an hour talking about your career in improv. How are you at learning lines and then going off book? Do you, do you suddenly find yourself straying into, into improv? And were, were there any improvisation uh, see, uh, scenes it, or any improvisation moments in a scene at any time in this film? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Mike was really good. We, uh, because uh, Kevin and I were, you know, such professionals, usually the first take was great and, um, you know, word perfect. So then Mike would say, okay, just, you know, throw stuff in. And I, I think um, some of it got into the film. And then after the credits, there's sort of a reel of a lot of the improv moments that we had. So it's a, um, I mean, it's a different muscle. Sometimes I find it hard once you have uh, the script in your mind to go off that and still keep the intention of the scene going and not go off in some weird tangent. Yeah, yeah. That, that this I, was I, because it was so, um, the framework was so great. I knew exactly what the scene was about and how I could play with it and yet still keep the, get the, the important information out. Well, when I stumbled earlier, I was I was going to mention something. I thought everyone mentions this, so I'm not going to. But now I'll mention it. I, I would have loved to have seen you in the middle of the film suddenly go into a hoedown. I mean, that would have been because I know you hate hoedown. And oh, that's why I stopped yeah. myself earlier. I was going to I was going to say to you, I, I, when I'm listening, thinking about you in the shower, I start singing a hoedown. What a horrible thing. Anyway, um, so all uh, all indie films uh I suppose it's the budget, but all indie films tend to be shot over 16 days. Normally, six, if not 16 days seems to be like the the period. And yeah. and this film was, and I, I have to mention here, a good friend of mine uh, who I work with very closely, and she's probably watching us now. She threatened to. Uh, that's Annie Jeeves from Cinematic Red, who I adore, uh, despite the fact she's got bright red hair. I don't know how she was born with such red hair. Have you met Annie? Yes, um, she is the publicist for this movie, so we've right. been in contact quite a bit. Well, I love Annie. I absolutely love her. And if she's watching, mwah, you know I love you. Um, so, Annie, of course, I never, ever pay any attention to any of the uh, 
the little nuggets of information she sends because I do my own research you know I'm not a morning tv show where they say tell me about your character I like to do it myself but this time I, I paid attention because this 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 really interested me um so this was this was shot on location at Kiwanis Sunshine Point Camp in Kingsville, Kingsville, mm -hmm. Ontario. And I'm thinking, it, and this is because Annie fed me with this information, and I thought, wow, this must have been surreal for Rachel Dejeuner since her grandfather ran summer programs at the camp in the 1970s. Yeah. I mean, that what's the likelihood of that happening? That's That's... It all sort of really came together, luckily, uh, to get this location, because if you're doing a summer camp movie, to find a camp in the summer, uh, there's a bit of a logistics problem, because mm -hmm. that's when they do their work. But luckily, this camp was a, uh, do some uh, reservations. So somehow Mike talked him into maybe pushing that back a little bit, so he had the month of uh, June, I think, to uh, shoot the movie. So it worked out beautifully. He had and the month of June. Months, was that the eight. girls' month or the boys' months? He had the month of June. Was that the girls' months or the boys' months at the camp? Oh, <laughs> the girls' months, I think. I think the girls were always first. You know, it also um, occurred to me uh, that this film called Boys vs. Girls, I want to keep saying it so people don't look for girls versus boys. It's boys versus girls. To me, it and you've probably heard this from other people, but it just it seems to play out like a series of comedy sketches, which are all linked by the storyline. Yeah. What was the film? Now you had three days there, so this question really doesn't apply to you. I thought you were you were there. You know, you seem to be in it a lot, so I I didn't realize this probably answers the question I'm going to ask you. I was wanted to know if the film was shot in sequence or in sketch style, but you just went in there and you popped into just your individual shot scenes. scene after scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mike would say, "Okay, this is what happened before. <laughs> Go." How do um, you do that? How do how do you you know, as a viewer, as I mean, I could ask this of any actor, but I never have done. How do you, how do you get into the moment, you know, where where you're new on set, and then suddenly you have to have known these people for a while. You you just are told what to do, and you just go with it, right? That's it, and you have to build a an instant relationship with everyone, which I think having the improv background um, helped me. Because there's many times I, I do work with various improv troops around the world, people I've never met before, but you immediately jump in with, okay, I'm totally trusting this person with my life and with what's going to happen over the next hour. They're my best friends right now. And so that's kind of what you do um, in a movie. It's like, okay, we're working together. We're trying to make this work. I'm, uh, we may be on opposite sides of um, good and bad, but we're working together. And... It's my job and to make them look as good uh, as possible. It's their job to make me look as good as possible. And you were, so you you were really a prima donna. You just came in for three days. You didn't want to be there for 16 days. You said, I'll come in for three days and just do my part and leave, you know, smoking a cigarette out of it. I was like 61. They were all staying on the campground in, you know, shacks. <laughs> Kevin and I were in a nice boutique hotel on the outskirts of town. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's actually I like it that way because um, I, just because the job of movie making can be very long and tedious. Oh yeah, you know yeah. it can take well, not that I've ever worked on a big budget <laughs> show, but I hear it can take a while. Um, I like this because I'm you're always invested in your you're into it and your energy keeps going. So it, it was nice to, to do that. Well, I thought uh, that Stephen Fry thought that you were in the, uh, in, in the Ben Hur with Charlton Heston when he, uh, when he asked you about that uh, uh, Stephen Boyd scene. I thought he was thinking that he'd seen you in, in Ben Hur. Oh, I, I do have that face. I, I actually thought I saw you in Ben Hur, but it was the silent version. But um, maybe I, I don't know. It must have been a lookalike. I've got to give out kudos here. So much work that I've never done. Someone started this thing that I was in. Are you being served? <laughs> no, that wasn't me. <laughs> Thank you. I've been seen in movies that I've never been in. Uh, Shaun of the Dead, apparently. 
No. I saw you this morning. I, I was picking up uh, some bagels in Trader Joe's. Weren't you the guy that was waiting on me in Trader Joe's? No, I have one of those faces. It, everybody knows someone who has it. And <laughs> I want to give kudos here to Mike Stasco. He might be watching us, I don't know, uh, for not including, this struck me as soon as the film was over, not including two usually uh, predictable ingredients in this genre of movie. And, and maybe this is partly because of the PC era, but I think it was probably more out of respect for the players. Uh, the incredibly beautiful young women in this film, and they, they, they are very, very beautiful, gifted actresses uh, or actors, as we now, I still use the word actress, but actors, uh, fabulous, well cast, very well cast, so kudos for that as well. They were not portrayed as sexual playthings for the boys. There was no nudity in it, which was fabulous. Um and in fact, the, the girls were uh, refreshingly equals in the storyline to the boys. Mm -hmm. And Jesse Camacho, uh, who, who I thought, uh, I think they all did a stellar job, but Jesse Camacho wasn't subjected to any body shaming scenes given his size. And I think both of those aspects of this film, uh, we, we should applaud Mike Stasco for not going there. I don't know if this okay. occurred to you at all. I, no, I, um, we had talked about it because I think the first couple of drafts he did uh, uh, of it had some of those elements and he decided to get rid of it. And I think to, um, to, to making the film better, it's nice that they, as you say, they're all equal partners. There is no body shaming on either side. There is no overt sexual um, uh, content. It's just... Um, it's just a fun, feel-good movie. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a few uh, adult words in it, which uh, you know we played a couple already. We're going to be playing one now because uh, Michaela Basser, I hope that's the right pronunciation. Uh, I thought was particularly well cast. Well, I, I I guess it was the way she performed it. It wasn't so much the way she was cast as the slightly off kilter goth girl. Mm -hmm. And I want to show us uh, everyone a, a scene now with the two of you. This will show um, what I'm talking about with your timing and just just, just your face, just the whole, everything that you do comes together here for me. It's nobody else, very few people can pull this off. And, and a warning to my audience, and I, don't, I normally don't give a damn about this, but, but just because this is a, a lighter show, and a warning to my audience, this clip has adult language, so turn the sound down if it offends you. Uh, there isn't, you know, as I said, th there aren't a lot of expletives in this w in in this film. There's a couple, but kids have heard them anyway before. But anyway, um, I, I and I, I want to also point out, but when they are said, and they're not said all the time, you know, this isn't pulp fiction. They aren't said all the time. When they are uttered, they have fabulous comedic effect, as I think everyone will see now. Anyway. Uh, I mentioned Colin's timing, his look, just everything. This is a perfect example of what I think Colin, uh, what I know Colin does so well. And this is Ever Try Pastels. Here we go. Do you think they're pissed? I'm sure they can take a joke. Hey, Danny. How was your winter? Sucked. My mom's back with Barry, and he's a fucking asshole and treats her like shit, but she deserves it. She made me clean my room the other day, and now I can't find any of my knives except for this one. And I know Barry sold them. Next day, he's buying super big gulps instead of regular big gulps. That ass turd better watch his six. Yeah. You ever tried pastels? I just love that scene. You know, I'm glad I, I was sent that scene. That line was improvised. I think that was one of the improvised, the pastel line. Well, what were you supposed to say? I can't remember. I think we had uh, different uh, different tries on that one. Wow. I, I mean, that for some reason... Uh, I, hope I, I'm not, I hope I'm not lying and just took one of my... I, listen... Uh, it, uh, yeah, I, I'll like. accept that. I'll accept that, and it and it makes me and it makes me respect your work even more. Um, I immediately thought, 
of uh, The Joy of Painting. Did you ever watch The Joy of Painting? Yes. Uh, with Bob Ross, I still watch that a lot. And I thought that's, I was thinking of Bob Ross, you know, pastels and anyway, because he used the knife. Boys versus Girls um, certainly doesn't feel like an independent. And we're, we're going to run an extra 15 minutes if that's okay with you. You okay. got time? You, I got time. You, got, you can manage it, can you? Yeah. You need to go to the bathroom or anything? People no, wait. Good, you know? good, oh, okay, good. Boys vs. Girls doesn't... Uh, it, it doesn't feel like an independent film. And I think the credit for this goes to you and Kevin MacDonald, plus the film's direction, the editing, the photography, and last but not least, uh, the incredible soundtrack. I love the music and the MTV vibe uh, of the opening credits. These days, you normally don't get credits at the beginning of a film. You get them at the end. This is almost like um, sort of a, it's not anywhere like it. I mean, it's nothing like it. I don't want people to get, you know, a different idea of this. But it almost had a Pink Panther-ish opening, you know. Just, just, I'm not giving that away. People all have to see it. But that is a standalone piece that I like, and I like the depiction of you as well at the beginning. I want to give some well-deserved shout-outs here. The writer, director, producer is Mike Stasco. Uh, the producer and editor is Theodore Bezer. The director of photography is Kyle Archibald. The production designer is Emily Insor, or Iansor. Um, forgive me if I mispronounce that. And the composer, Mark Calcott. I guess these are all relatives of each other. Do you know if that's true? But yeah, everyone's related. I wanted what I also uh, what I'd also like to do, Colin, is is very quickly here uh, show some photographs on the sc screen of the cast members. If you, if you have any thoughts or comments about any of them, feel free to do it. I'm going to nip through them, and I'll tell you that the first two is is Rachel and Eric who are, I guess, the leads. Let's put them up there. There you go. Well, as you say, I mean, they're both very attractive young people. And uh, again, both uh, very lovely. And I didn't know Eric, but he worked with my nephew, uh, Monroe Chambers, on uh, Degrassi, uh, which uh, is very popular. Yes. So we had that sort of a, almost sort of a link and Rachel, I'd never met before, but she has, um, she's done a few things. She, I don't think anyone came in here uh, totally um, uh, fresh faced. No, they didn't. They've, they've all, they've all got some history behind them and some good history behind them. The next person that doesn't need really any introduction, uh, and you've already spoken about him, is the great Kevin McDonald. He's got a face like yours. You, you know, I you've got to include him in this. He, you look at his face. And you know, there's there's mischief a store. He's uh, so great, and I remember like watching the kids at the hall in this uh, theater, in a small club in uh, Toronto. I guess it would be in the early '90s, and just blown away by them. This was before the TV show, and they were uh, they were amazing. And I've gotten to work with Kevin a few times over the years, and it's it's always just fun. He's, he's got just such a great face. Now, Jesse Camacho that I mentioned earlier, uh, he, he really didn't portray his character as so many buffoony films would have had him portray it. You know, yeah. he's, he's, he's a, he's a, he, he's a largish fella, but he's also got a huge personality. And uh, I like, uh, well, I was going to mention a scene, but I'm not going to do that. So I, let's, uh, I've never, uh, I've never cared for Jesse. No. Um, no, absolutely not true. Uh, Jesse, I met years ago. He did a show called Less Than Kind, which he was brilliant in. If you can find it, uh, do. A great cast. Um, the producer and the showrunner was a certain uh, Mark McKinney, another kid in the hall. Uh, oh. He wrote some of the episodes. Um, yeah. And uh, Jesse is uh, fabulous in that. So we would meet sort of in the circuit, uh, you know, every pilot season uh an incredibly talented guy and uh, personality uh, beyond the next photo i've got is romeo carrera uh romeo carrera and tim dc uh interesting name let's have a look at them uh 
Tim t- Tim uh, is playing, I guess the uh, the camp. I don't know what I don't know what to call him. I don't, I don't I don't want to stereotype him, but he he tends to play the not too smart person. Yeah. Almost, uh, I I don't know if it's chemically induced or. Um, I, I think chemically yeah. induced it would would be appropriate. But anyway, they they were they both had uh, good roles in this. Now Michaela Brasseur, who uh, yeah. we've just seen you with, she looks. I, I haven't seen what she really looks like, but uh, uh, she really did that job well. Yeah, she was great. She's not goth-like, uh, at least from the three days um, I, I saw her. She, off camera, she wasn't very gothy. She wasn't very gothy. Uh, next is Maya Rome, or Mia, Mia Rome. I'm looking at the, what it says on here. She's the good. She's like the the good girl next door type. The all-American all yeah. girl. She could be in Sex in the City. She looks like a, a character from Sex, and and she again, she she uh, she was she was each one of these girls portrayed how they were made to look in this film. I like this. Uh, I've got a couple more. Samantha Holt, Samantha Helt, uh, who is kind of the bratty one. The yeah, the, all of them. Um were perfect for the parts and together it just made such a strong, uh, strong grouping, uh, both on the girls and the boys side. And I apologize uh, to, to your great director. I did have a photo of him, no. but it isn't, uh, it isn't here set up. So uh, I, I, I apologies for that. So, um, I have, oh yes, just a couple of other things I, I want to touch on. I'll give details on watching and following the film on social media in a few seconds. Uh, I just want to just catch up very quickly now on, on the last, uh, on some facets of your career. Your book, Not Quite the Classics, is now considered better than anything Shakespeare ever wrote, uh, where you take perfectly respected classics and give them the mockery uh, treatment. Um do you, do you recommend people go out and buy this for a good old time? Sure. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to write a book. My agent said, hey, why don't you write a book? And I said, I don't. The reason I improvise is because I'm basically lazy and I can just make up stuff. Writing takes time. You've got to have a framework. And uh, based on that, he got me a book deal. So I thought, oh, well, I guess I better write a book. So I took the first and last line from famous novels. And then that was my starting point. That was my end point. And then just made up everything in between. You made up everything in between. I've got to get a copy of that because... Uh, yeah, there's, I, um, I'd say it's all right. Yeah. Yeah, you think yeah, so? Yeah, really good story. Well, you know what? If I, don't, if I don't dirty the pages, I'll buy it at Barnes & Noble and take yeah, it back. It's also when I good. It. It's like thick enough. It kills a good amount of bugs. Oh, I, you know what? We've got a draft that we've been trying to get rid of. Do you think it will stop Perfect. a draft? Okay. Oh, yeah. It's, okay. it's a, the Swiss Army knife of books. Oh, good, good, good. Um, Stream of Consciousness with Brad Sherwood is your... Mm. This is brilliant. Brilliant, folks. And you can all take an advantage of this. This is your live improv show. Let's just put a picture up while I'm doing this of, of the two of you so people can see this. Uh, Stream of Consciousness with Brad Sherwood is your live improv show via Zoom where the audience interacts with the two of you. So so essentially, um, w from what I can see, because I haven't participated, is that people pay a nominal amount of money and then they team up with you on Zoom and they do a bit of a whose line is it anyway type of setup, right? Is that basically yeah, it in a nutshell? A, kind of like our um, stage show in that everything is improvised. Uh, through a technology I do not understand, um, we can go into people's living rooms and converse with them. We can have them in our scenes. Uh, every scene is improvised. It's uh, And because of the green screen technology, we can do things that we can't usually do in our um, stage show. So it's been fun sort of fooling around with the technology. And you, of course, are, are coming to us in front of your green screen. So by... Uh... But the only thing you have to do is when you do this show, as I'm sure you're aware, you mustn't wear anything green. Otherwise, you just see your head floating around, which could be funny. But um, uh, and I also want to mention that uh, when we don't have a pandemic, you, you do live shows with your wife, Deborah McGrath. 
mm-hmm. uh, and uh, you know for upcoming shows uh, y- you can watch Colin's social media to, to get details on that I want to just close here by telling everyone my guest has been Colin Mockery his latest film uh, is called Boys vs. Girls. If you're watching this show, you will have all the information under his face. If you're not watching the girls, uh, you can go to Boys v. Girls, not VS, Boys v. Girls movie.ca. Uh, as always, if you go to the silverstonecollection.com, there will be a whole page devoted to today's show links to Colin, links to the film, photographs of people I showed on the show, so you, you can see all that. Um, but visit Boys vs. Girls movie, uh, and you will you can watch uh, everything you want to on there, behind-the-scenes stuff, all of their social media sites are linked from there. And also, to keep in touch with Colin and, and, and the genius of Colin Mockery, and to stay informed about everything he's up to and he's got a really neat website i love the way that this has been set up uh all you've got to do is go to colinmockery.com which is c-o-l-i-n-m-o-c-h-r-i-e.com but of course if you're watching this on youtube the link's below uh if you're on the website the link's below if you're on instagram the link's below or go to the silverstonecollection.com Anyway, I'm closing today's show with, with, with something very special, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's another look at the film, but in the music video of, of its soundtrack. It's called, the song is called Girl, Boys vs. Girls, excuse me. It's by uh, this new singer called Huey Springsteen. I don't know. Uh, Colin, it has been a privilege to have you on the show. And I really do hope that we can do this again. I hope so, Phil. It was lovely. Lovely talking to you. I love you all. I'll see you all next week. Let's close out with a music video of this wonderful new film. And then after dinner tonight, if you're watching live or wherever you are in, uh, in America or Canada, whatever time of day you're watching or listening to this, go and watch the movie now. Okay? It's on your local streaming network. Wait, hold on. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Uh, let's hear it for Jeremy, everybody. Way to go, Jeremy. I can tell you've been practicing this year. And for our final act, we're gonna win that show. We're gonna do it. Who are gonna lip sync to the hit single Boys vs. Girls by Huey Springsteen.
what an incredible performance. Clearly, the rest of the night was a waste of time because we have our winners right here.